my name is John Morello. I run our uh, hybrid cloud uh, consulting practice for the Americas. I've been at Microsoft for, for about 13 years now. What we're going to talk about today is uh, basically how do we connect your on-premises data center, uh, what you can do with the Microsoft private cloud stack with System Center and, and Windows Server. How do we connect that to Windows Azure to really allow you to have that hybrid infrastructure as a service experience in your organization? And really the, the, the purpose of, of this session is, is to really focus on how to do that well from an infrastructure perspective. And, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of pieces that go into kind of creating a hybrid, hybrid cloud scenario, right? You've got your, uh, your management layer that you do within System Center. You've got network connectivity, which we'll look at today. You've also got uh, best practices for extending your Active Directory uh, as well. We're going to look at all of those pieces there to really figure out how do you build an infrastructure fabric that spans what you've got in your existing on-premises environment and what you're capable of doing within virtual machines within Windows Azure. So if we think about the, uh, the agenda for today, and get a little bit of a look at what, what hybrid infrastructure as a service actually is. Uh, like most vendors, Microsoft's kind of uh, um, you know, grown and evolved their definition of it, and, and when we're talking about uh, hybrid, I want to be really specific about what are the, what are the specific scenarios that, that make something a true hybrid uh, IaaS model. After that, we're going to look a little bit more deeply at the Azure networking architecture, how do virtual networks work, how do you connect a machine or a uh, virtual uh, a VPN device from one location into Azure. We'll take a little bit of a look in the uh, Azure portal so you can see some of that live. We're not actually going to go through a setup of it live, but you can see what, what it looks like in the UI after it's been configured. Uh, then we'll do a walkthrough of how do we connect uh, kind of a common enterprise class uh, edge device, in this case a Cisco ASA, how do we connect that to Windows Azure? So really from start to finish, I've got a you know, blank Windows Azure subscription and I've got an unconfigured ASA. What are all the steps that are required to do that? Uh, and then we're going to look more into Active Directory as we talked about. We're going to do another walkthrough of Active Directory and then talk about some security best practices for the environment as well. So there's microphones throughout the room here. Um, please, if you have any questions or uh, any topics or, or just scenarios that you'd like to discuss as we go through this, please feel free to step up to a mic. I'd be more than happy to pause and answer questions. We should have adequate time in the, uh, in the session to do that. So if there is anything that you'd like to discuss in more detail or anything that's unclear, uh, don't be shy about asking. So if we think, first of all, what are the problems that we're trying to solve? You know, what, what is the reason why you would want to be, be building one of these hybrid cloud models in the first place? Uh, you know, we really think about these, these five challenges, and you, you've probably seen a lot of this, maybe even the same slide, but at least a lot of these themes throughout TechEd uh, yesterday and today and throughout the remainder of this week. But really, the, these five kind of challenges that we see here are the things that are driving people towards these hybrid models. So the, the need to drive greater IT efficiency, you know, basically, how can I do more with less? I think back in when we launched Server 2003, that was actually the tagline for that release, and you know, here it is 10 years later, uh, and we're, you know, we're still really focused on driving down the economics of delivering infrastructure and kind of back-end server operations for our customers. We have a lot of new tools to do that now, though, of course, not only what we deliver in the on-premises environment, but also what we can do within Windows Azure. So being able to drive down the cost is a big part of it. But honestly, I think probably the, the bigger thing that's driving a lot of people to, uh, to Windows Azure is this idea of, of reducing the time to solution. If you think about at least what we experience with a lot of the enterprise customers that we work with in Microsoft Services, when we work with a, you know, a Fortune 500 company or some large government organization or something like that, and, and they're looking to deploy uh, private cloud technologies or just kind of any sort of infrastructure services, uh, the time to actually get that equipment in place to, to procure new storage, to procure new compute capacity, whatever it may be, uh, oftentimes is, is, not, you know, is not something that happens as quickly as anybody would like. Uh, you know, especially if I have to go out and purchase new equipment to, to, to add that capacity, you might be talking about additional you know, weeks or maybe months to, to get that environment uh, stood up. Uh, one example of that is a financial services firm that, that we worked with recently, a very, very well-known, one of the top two banks in the, in the country. Um, where they have a very large dev test environment. Uh, and that dev test environment is where they build their, their public-facing website, where they build their financial analytics applications and so forth. And they really had a big frustration in that the time that it took for somebody to provision a VM in that environment, it was already a virtualized environment, but to the time to provision a virtual machine in that environment could literally take two to three weeks because the time it was required for somebody to make the request, somebody else to receive it, to kind of put it into a queue, to act on it, was very lengthy. Uh, so they were looking for us to deliver them a self-service solution, a lot more automation around that. But at the same time, this bank, they had this, such a large dev test community 
they really had a very a, a large struggle, I guess, with, with just having the amount of capacity that they needed to for people to build and test their applications. So in addition to providing that self-service capacity, what they really wanted was the ability to expand that dev test environment out into Windows Azure so that instead of them having to worry about, you know, do I have enough SAN space, do I have enough compute capacity in my environment, uh, or you know, do I need to go and purchase some, some additional ones, they literally have a, you know, a, a demand-based pricing model for that where they know if they need you know, 20 cores of capacity and a terabyte of storage to run a test run, it's going to cost this amount of money and they've got an ability to do that. But the back-end operations and the back-end expense of building that out is Microsoft's problem and not their problem. And that's a really good example of, of that idea of reducing time to solutions. It's not just about you know, providing a self-service capacity, but how can you deliver that, that complete scenario for the customer in a way that's just faster than you could do it on your own, right? You, you can only you know, buy and rack and, and install servers so quickly, whereas we at Microsoft have, you know, we, that's kind of the core part of our business. We're buying servers and you know, units of 10,000 annually or whatever it may be. Uh, so we have a lot greater capacity pool to, to be able to deliver those, uh, those resources from. But the other thing that I want to highlight on this slide that I think is particularly interesting that, that drives the hybrid model is, a, is this idea of compliance. Um, you know, for, for a lot of things that you see on this slide, this idea of, of reducing costs, greater efficiency, scalability, and so forth, you could look at that and say, well, these are all reasons why I would want to put something directly in the public cloud, directly in Windows Azure, right? Why are we even talking about hybrid stuff? Uh, if I can go to Azure, or I can go to AWS, or, or some other host, or Rackspace, or Savvis, or whomever, and I can just you know, pull out my credit card or, or get some purchase agreement in place, and I can buy the compute capacity that I need to, and I'm buying on a pay-per-use basis. Why do I even care about any sort of on-premises-based environment? Uh, and certainly, if you look to some, some of the vendors that are out there, particularly the ones that are pure play on that side, uh, like, like Amazon and others, you know, they'll, they'll be the first to tell you, that's right, you don't really need to worry about what's on-premises anymore. We can do it better, faster, cheaper, easier, and all that stuff uh, from our data centers. But the reality is, for, for most customers, there are, there's some set of compliance or regulatory needs. There's something that, that probably uh, necessitates you having a greater control of at least a subset of your data than you may be able to get in the public cloud. For example, you might operate in an organization that's got some sort of, of HIPAA, some sort of healthcare or health privacy based um, concerns that you have to protect patient data. And that patient data has to be protected in a particular manner. You've already got a set of controls that are in place that you use in your data center to protect that data at rest and in motion and so forth. And you don't want to give those up. You don't want to lose that capacity simply because uh, you've deployed something into Azure or some other location. But at the same time, you'd like to have that bursting capability. And that's really that, the sort of model that, that we're talking about today is that hybrid model allows you to kind of have the best of both worlds. And for you to be able to decide based on a given workload or a given point in time, where do you want a piece of data to live? Where do you want a specific virtual machine to operate? To be able to bring it back from the public cloud, to be able to move something that's in your data center to the public cloud in a very seamless way, those are really the scenarios that we're trying to address with this, to make it very easy for you to both be able to take advantage of those efficiency and reduce time to solution benefits, as well as to be able to balance your compliance needs that you already have. This is another slide that I'm sure you guys have already seen and, and one that you'll certainly see um, you know, consistently throughout TechEd and, and other Microsoft events. But you know, we have this idea, of, sometimes it's referred to as the cloud OS, but basically it's you know, what, is, what is the Microsoft infrastructure story for delivering this hybrid cloud pattern to, to customers? And it's really built up of these three pieces. Windows Azure is obviously our public cloud piece. That's where you're able to run virtual machines and virtual networks and very high scale compute and storage and so forth. Windows Server is obviously the on-premises compute and storage engine. And then System Center is, the, is really kind of the key piece to this because System Center allows us to be able to manage and deploy and configure across both of those environments. And that ability to have a seamless set of user and administrator experiences is really one of the key things that we want to deliver to our customers. In other words, if you're going to be able to run this hybrid infrastructure and be able to deliver an application or deliver a workload uh, out there to your end users, you don't want your end users to really know or care or really have any idea about whether or not that virtual machine or that server that they're connecting to lives in your data center or lives in Windows Azure, right? I should be able just to open up my browser or open up my application and it works without having to worry about where it's actually located and what particular data center it may be hosted in at a, at a given point in time. Ideally, I should be able to just take that application or that data set and move it from my on-premises environment to Azure or from Azure back to my own environment without really making that obvious or, or even introducing any sort of change to the user experience for my end user community. 
If you guys think about probably the, the bigger challenges that you're faced with in your jobs day to day, a lot of those bigger challenges probably revolve around how do we make changes or how do we move things around uh, or upgrade systems in a way that doesn't impact the users, right? You know, what are the change windows and all the other stuff that kind of goes into that. Well, if we have a, a way to do that with minimal or, or hopefully in some cases at least no impact to the end users, it makes your job a lot easier to do because you're not having to do these operations at, you know, at off hours or worry about the impact and, and so forth. But at the same time we're delivering that common user experience, we also want to be able to deliver a very common administrator experience. And that's really for you. That's kind of a self-serving uh, capability, I guess you'd say. But if you as an administrator have to look at a very dispersed set of tools, you know, I look at one web portal to monitor what I've got running in Azure. I, I look at another tool for running what's running in my on-premises environment. Maybe I have yet a third tool that I use to look at resources that are running in Amazon. It's very difficult for you to manage that, and it's even more difficult for you, I think, to have a really seamless way to aggregate that capacity and to really run it as a true pool of compute and storage capacity. Instead, you're looking at kind of distinct pools and distinct ways to manage it and, and, and leverage it. System Center is really that, that glue piece that allows you to have that common administrative experience through App Controller for the, the self-service portal, Operations Manager to allow you to be able to, to have insight into the operational status of uh, various servers and, and equipment that's in there, but to be able to do that across not just what exists in your private cloud in your own data center, but also what happens in Azure. And you guys probably also saw recently we, re we released an operations management pack for uh, Amazon to also see what's in Amazon, and potentially to also see what's in third-party clouds. We've got a lot of, uh, of hoster partners that, that Microsoft works with that are enabling those same sorts of capabilities in clouds that they run in sort of a virtual private cloud environment, like think about Rackspace and Savvis and organizations like that, that are able to deliver those sorts of capabilities out of their own data centers as well. But the real key thing there is that System Center is, is the glue that, that binds all that together and really allows you to have that commonality of experiences. The other part that we're going to really spend a lot of time focusing on today is, is identity, because identity is a really key component of being able to do this well. If you think about a branch office design or, or a design that you might do in your own data centers today where uh, you want to, to deploy new services into a new colo facility to, or, to, or you're expanding to a new data center, probably one of the very first things that you're going to consider doing once you've kind of got that ping power pipe stuff already in place and you can start bringing up compute resources is to extend your Active Directory into that, right? You want to have a localized, low latency, uh, very fast way of doing authentication and authorization within that, within that specific site. And Azure really is no different. So as we think about extending your, your existing infrastructure as a service capability into Windows Azure, one of the really important things for us to consider that we're going to look at uh, today is how do we extend Active Directory in a, in a way that really works well with AD, but gives us that very survivable option so that if we have a bunch of compute resources, a bunch of servers, or whatever else may be running in Azure, and we want to make sure that, that that authentication that happens with them is localized so that we're not having to pay for a lot of additional bandwidth back and forth, but also that the environment is survivable such that if we lose the VPN connection, we lose the virtual network for some reason, that the resources there are still going to operate, that they're still going to be accessible, that they're still going to be able to authenticate callers and so forth. So this is another slide that uh, you probably have seen a lot during the week and will continue to see. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just to point out the, the, really the, the idea that we have and the, the design principle that we have at Microsoft for how to do this, this hybrid model is to give you a set of parallel capabilities on the private cloud stack that's primarily delivered through Windows Server and then on the public cloud side delivered through Windows Azure with a common set of APIs and a common set of management services across them. That doesn't mean that under the covers the actual bits and the binaries that are used to create some of these things are exactly identical. For example, the storage that you have in Windows Server is a very different sort of underlying architecture than the storage that we do within Windows Azure, right? The, the, the way that we build it, the sort of model that you have in place is very different. But we've done a good job in some ways and are going to continue to do more work to, ex to make that common experience present in the sense that even though the back-end storage and the way that we manage uh, the actual disk and redundancy and geodispersion of, of data within Azure is dramatically different than what, what you probably do with Windows Server in your own data center, you're still dealing with the same sort of higher level constructs. You're still, in, still dealing with virtual hard drives, you're still dealing with virtual machines, and the way that you connect those is, is very similar to the way that you use so on premises. And if you look through the, the, the actual the stack kind of top to bottom, that's sort of the philosophy that we have throughout in that we may not engineer the underlying elements exactly the same because the problems and the sorts of challenges, the constraints that you have in your own on-premise environment are very different than what we might have running these at 
you know, across multiple, multiple hundreds of thousands of servers in Azure. But if we can provide you a consistent API surface to develop against, a consistent scripting surface for you to administrate against, and a consistent administrative UI for you to monitor and to, to work with, then it really doesn't matter what sort of the underlying plumbing might be because you have that common experience both for your end users and for you as IT pros. So if you think about what we're going to really look at in this session today, it's really this kind of this bottom piece here. How do we build the virtual network? How do we make sure that the site, the stuff that you've got in this on-premise environment, and that that connectivity is durable in the case of there being some sort of loss of the link, it's durable in the case of you needing to expand to a large number of users that are accessing resources in the public cloud. Basically, how do we do that in a way that's going to allow you to scale as though the resources in Azure are just another piece of your larger environment? And then most importantly, or I guess at least as importantly, is how do we do that securely? Um, because one of the things that we found working with a lot of customers initially uh, that are starting to explore Azure and are really starting to do a lot more work, particularly in the infrastructure of the service space, is a lot of people kind of have this idea that, um, or, or maybe a notion at least, that, that just because something is running in a Microsoft Data Center, something is running in Azure, that, that somehow sort of the fundamental best practices around security no longer apply, uh, or that, that, that we're taking care of all of that for them. And there's a lot of stuff that we do in the platform to, to provide you additional protections. But at the same time, you don't want to put up a, a virtual machine uh, directly on the internet and have, have RDP exposed to it and choose password one as your password, right? Because there's a, there's a million and one bots out there that are just grinding away looking for open vulnerable hosts. And that open vulnerable host that's hosted in Azure is just as open and vulnerable there as it would be in your own data center. So we're going to talk not so much about basic things like that, but what are some real core concepts that you can apply to protect your virtual machines that are running in Azure so that you know that what's running up there is going to have the same level of security and, and sophistication against attacks that you have in what runs in your own on-premises environment. So what, what we're going to look at on this slide here is, is this is sort of the, I guess the, 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 the prototypical, stereotypical, whatever you want to call it, the kind of the standard model that we see a lot of customers looking at building within, uh, within Azure today, uh, which is, in a very simplistic way, we have some sort of on-premises network. Obviously, for, for most of you guys, it's you know, more complex, I'm sure, than just a single location and a single set of servers. But you, know, you can think of this, this as sort of your existing cloud, I guess, if you will, of, of stuff that runs in data centers that you run. And then there's a set of networks, a set of, of subscriptions and, and components that you have running within Azure. And what you want to be able to do is to connect those resources that are running your on-premises environment to those things that are actually running in Azure, such that if I deploy a new Active Directory uh, domain controller, I could deploy that locally or I could deploy it in Azure, and I would have the same sort of experiences to be able to authenticate the same kinds of users, do the same things with it. Similarly, if I deploy an IIS server here in my uh, on-premise environment, later on I decide I want to move that into Azure because I want to take advantage of uh, of you know, some of the capabilities within Azure from a storage or geodistribution standpoint or the Azure CDN or what have you, I can do that without having to have any sort of change really required to the configuration of that server. I simply take the VM, move the VM to Azure, and execute that virtual machine in Azure instead. So what, what we're going to be doing really throughout the remainder of the session is how do we build this design? Uh, you know, what are the steps that we need to go through to go from you know, something where this in, in kind of middle piece here doesn't exist to having this entire thing built out with the virtual networks in place, with the Active Directory requirements in place, so that you have that full end-to-end -end capability. Before we kind of close out the introductory part, let's think a little bit um, about what the kind of the overall journey is from where a lot of customers are today at that kind of traditional, maybe, maybe virtualized, but uh, not you know, truly a cloud model, to where we're going with this. You know, what is sort of the end state that we want to be able to deliver to the end users which may be just not individuals, but also business units that you work with, what is the end state that we want to deliver throughout, uh, throughout this, this build out? So if you think about where the, the kind of the distribution models of, of computing are, are mostly at today, I think I will kind of argue it's probably more on the virtualized stack and, and less on the traditional non-virtualized side. But in any case, most customers today are really not operating at, at what, what we would really consider to be true a cloud mentality in the sense that you've got real elastic resources and resource pooling and everything is self-service and orchestrated and so forth. Most customers seem to be really sort of in this middle pace of being virtualized and maybe starting to, to kind of get more into the private cloud model. And certainly there's some that are further ahead than others, but 
really what we want to be able to do is to help the mass market get from where they're at today to something where they're in a much more of a cloud operating mentality, combining the both of, of private and public capabilities. So if we think that's where the future is going, what is Microsoft doing to help get you there? I think this screenshot from, from um, App Controller is a really good way to kind of see some of the pieces that, that go into it in a way that, that really kind of brings together the whole scenario. So if you think about what we want to achieve at the end of this session, you know, what we're, that, that slide that I previously showed to you where we're going to build out that hybrid environment where we've got some stuff running on-prem, stuff, some stuff running on Azure, what does it look like to somebody that's a business unit user in your organization? You know, somebody, back to my example of a financial services company earlier, somebody that's in that dev test community that wants to go and create a new virtual machine, what does it actually look like for them? What is the experience that they get from it? And, and this slide and this, this kind of screen check kind of pulls all that stuff together for you in the sense that, first of all, it's a self-service-based capability. You know, I log in as a person, and that person, because you've defined my role within System Center, that person is granted a particular quota, a particular allotment of compute and network and storage resources. And that based on whatever System Center has been instructed to do, I've got the ability to self-service, to kind of manage my own resources within the boundaries of that quota. But you as the administrators don't have to worry about every individual action that I'm taking. You just kind of set, this is the parameters that I want him to operate in, and now it becomes a self-service capability where they can now control what that looks like on their own behalf and not have to involve you to do it. So it's sort of the evolution of IT from, from being a service delivery organization to really being more of a service providing organization. Shift, but, but definitely an important one. So virtual machines is really the, the, the node that we're looking at here, but, but the real key thing to think about is I, as that end user, when I come in here, I can manage not just stuff that's in my own on-premises environment in these Contoso um, organizations that you see here, these Contoso clouds that are defined here, but also what exists in Windows Azure. So through one tool, through what I get within App Controller, I go and I log in. I have a set of quotas that the system, that you have set within the system that are going to bind what I'm able to do in the environment. And then from there, I'm able to create, provision, manage my virtual machines and really have a very much uh, similar sort of experience to what I would have normally if I were just going and deploying an application or deploying a virtual machine and I had full control of the environment I was doing it in. But instead of having that full control of the environment, I'm obviously just operating within a subset of that. So the idea here really that we're, that we're trying to deliver is when you log in to, to that portal, when you're an end user and you want to procure IT services, that the services that I'm able to get as that end user from my own IT department are even better than what I can go out there and get directly from Amazon or from Azure or that I can get from anybody that I just present a credit card to. Because one of the, I think the fundamental shifts that we're all dealing with that are in this industry is you as an IT pro are no longer just the single sole source provider for your organization, right? You know, in years past, if you think maybe 10 years ago, if somebody wanted to get a server, if somebody wanted to get a file share created, wanted to deploy SharePoint or whatever, in almost all cases, the only place that they were going to be able to do that from was to come to you that worked in the IT department, tell them your, you know, they would tell you their needs and you would prioritize that and, and you know, likely help them out and get it get it set up or deployed for them or what have you. But, but you were essentially you know, the, only, the only game in town, right? There was, there was nobody that they were going to go to off the street and say, hey, you know, set up this file share for me, because you were really the only place that could deliver that within the identity framework they worked in, within the connectivity that they had, and so forth. If you fast forward 10 years from now until today, you're not the only game in town. In fact, you're, you're one of many different providers that, that a lot of uh, people are already familiar with. You know, for example, if I'm a... Uh, if I'm somebody that wants to simply deploy a new server, I need to be able to run a website to run a marketing campaign. I don't have to go to central IT to do that, right? I can really easily go directly to Azure. I can really easily go directly to Amazon. I can pull out a credit card, and I can eventually I can have that website almost instantaneously without having to involve anybody else in the IT department. Similarly, not just simple things like websites. If I want to build out a very complex, multi-tiered application and do the same thing, I can do that without you and IT having really any visibility of that going on. Is that a good thing? Probably not in a lot of cases. One of the examples that, that I've uh, encountered with a, with a large retailer uh, last year was they had uh, quite a bit of, of campaigns that they were doing around Black Friday, around the, you know, the day after Thanksgiving, when they have a lot of you know, very kind of secretive promotional activities that they prepare for, for literally months in advance to try to drive traffic to their stores and to their websites so that they can really have a big hit of sales on that, that day after Thanksgiving. Uh, so their marketing department had really worked hard on that. They had a lot of, you know, a lot of really attractive pricing and special offers and so forth. And their marketing department uh, decided they wanted to have a you know, large web campaign that went along with that. 
So they were frustrated with central IT. They thought it took too long to deploy things, too long to, to, uh, to get things built out. So they decided they were just going to go directly to Amazon. And so their marketing team went out there and, and uh, you know, procured a bunch of, of services on Amazon, put up a bunch of data on there, ran their campaign. Everything seemed to work, work relatively well. Uh, and then not very long later, uh, one of their uh, auditors discovered the fact that you know, there was this charge, there was this bill that uh, you know, wasn't encountered, and you know, why was this going out there, and what was the services for, and they kind of un unraveled the, the whole story. You know, and then it turns out, you know, if you're a retailer and you're working, you know, working to have a lot of confidential information about what your pricing strategy is around kind of the peak time of year for you, and now you're hosting all that data on one of your primary competitor servers, that's probably a kind of a weird place to be in, right? I mean, it's not to say that Amazon was doing anything, you know, malicious or misusing the data. I'm not, not implying that at all. But it's also kind of strange, right? You want to have at least some idea of the data that's important to you, where it is, and make sure that you're not putting that data uh, on some service or some resource that's, you know, it's really maybe not acting in your best interest or maybe competing directly against you. And I think the, the, the example that, that that really tries to convey is if we're not able to do this better, faster, cheaper, and just honestly easier than the competitors that are out there that are competing for, for your end user's time and attention and dollars, then eventually they're going to go to those competitors and you, you as IT become the people that just maintain the legacy environment. And what we really want to do with this hybrid model is to be able to balance all those needs you have to keep the business that already exists, to keep all that stuff running. You can't just walk away and throw away the you know, 20 or 30 or however many years of, of existing IT investment that you've already got, but you also be able, need to be able to stitch that together with these new capabilities so that you can act faster and really service those needs in a way that, that people are expecting these days. And that's really the sort of journey. That's what we really want to deliver with this sort of user experience here is how can we be able to give them that balance while still maintaining that control, that capability that we showed on the previous slide of being able to balance that time to solution, do that much faster while still maintaining regulatory and business compliance needs. Okay, so we'll transition now a little bit and get, get more into the technology talk about this, which is to, to look first at what is Azure networking. Uh, there have been a couple of changes that were actually announced um, at TechEd yesterday. So before I get too much into this, let me, let me just kind of briefly uh, summarize the, the main thing that, that you know, was added yesterday from a networking standpoint, which is the ability to have now uh, ACLs on your network. So, so what, we're, what you'll see in the slides here and, and uh, what we'll talk about doesn't have a lot to, I guess, of direct implications of that. But one of the features that was added yesterday and is available in the service now is the ability for you to actually set an access control list uh, within your cloud service and within individual endpoints in that cloud service. So think of that as, as essentially having a firewall capability that you can use to create multiple network zones within Azure or even a uh, host space, I won't say host space, but kind of a closer to the host space firewall that you can deliver to the virtual machines. Prior to that announcement, prior to that capability being ex in existence, we had the ability to do so but only at kind of the cloud service level. So only, only at an aggregate level of multiple virtual machines could we publish individual endpoints and ports. Now we have the ability to do that on a much more granular basis, much more common to what you've seen with kind of a traditional virtual firewall capability. But we'll look at that later when we get to the security uh, section, but I just want to point that out because you may have heard that yesterday in the keynote or seen some announcements of that, and it's definitely related to the material that we're, that we're covering here. So if you think about what, what Azure Virtual Network is, um, Virtual network is a term that we use that sort of combines a lot of capabilities within Azure, but, but really is all about how do we do networking at scale within Azure and extend those networks that we build in Azure to your on-premises environment. So it's not just the ability to do VPN, although VPN is a big part of it, it's also the ability for you to be able to define arbitrary network topologies that exist inside Azure for you to define your own routing uh, topology within that, basically based on the way that you create VLANs, and for you to also manage name resolution services within Azure. So instead of you having to simply go out there within Azure, you know, create a virtual machine and kind of take defaults and take the networking defaults that are given to you, the virtual network capability allows you to have a much stronger level of control over how that looks. So if you think about what you do within Hyper-V or maybe what you do within vSphere or whatever tool that you use on premises for doing virtualization today, it's roughly equivalent, you could think of, as sort of the, the virtual switch settings, the, vir you know, the virtual network settings that you get uh, within those hypervisor products. Obviously, a lot of differences because this is sort of a fabric level thing as opposed to a host level thing. But if you're trying to draw parallels in your mind, that's a decent way to think about it. Um, because what you're doing, again, is setting up kind of the broader virtualized network environment that devices, and in this case in Azure, virtual machines, are going to be connected to. 
So when you think about building out an environment in Azure, typically one of the first things that you'll do is to create that virtual network, just like if you're building out an on-premises environment, one of the first things that you'll do is to create the actual physical network for things to configure and to connect to. So really not very different from that kind of physical mentality that exists today, just being operated within the Azure uh, virtual network environment instead. So again, it's the idea of being able to, to basically take your data center and run that in the, in the cloud, to so be able to take all the sorts of controls and capabilities that you may be familiar with today, the ability to create VLANs, the ability to use custom DNS, again, now the ability to set uh, access control list, and to be able to deliver that within virtual machines and networks that you define inside of Azure. So you also have the ability to have uh, that virtual network extended into your on-premises environment. And that's really what we're going to look at next, is, is how do we take uh, the network that's been developed in Azure, the network topology that you create within there, the VLANs that you set up, the DNS servers that you create in there, all the settings, and how do you connect that stuff into your existing on-premises environment such that if I'm an end user and I just you know, simply want to do a ping test, for example, something very basic, or I want to connect to a file server, I can do that without having to know the network topology in Azure, without really having to do anything differently. If I have file server one uh, in my environment today and I you know, go whack whack server, whack share, and I get access to my data, and you take that virtual machine that is server one and you move that into Azure, tomorrow if I'm an end user and I'm accessing it, I don't have to do anything differently. It looks and behaves exactly the same way because the end-to-end -end connectivity is there and it's provided by this virtual network. It's provided independently of the virtual machines or of the users or devices that are accessing the environment. So obviously it does enable many new scenarios, hybrid private cloud stuff, uh, being able to extend your Active Directory like we talked about, being able to run SharePoint in Azure, which is a very common experience that we're seeing a lot of, a lot of customers looking to do now. Uh, and then to be able to provide that capability to combine not just the infrastructure as a service capabilities within Azure, but also the platform as a service capabilities there. So if you guys, you know, if you're familiar with kind of the difference between IaaS and PaaS, really what we deliver in, in Azure is both. You know, with Azure, we started out really as a platform as a service uh, cloud provider. So if you wrote your application in a very specific way, if you leveraged the, the Azure API framework, you created essentially a stateless application, you got basically infinite scalability, you got geo-awareness, redundancy, service healing, all these really great things um, because you didn't have to have a tie directly from the application to the OS that it was running in. By building that Azure-based application, it made it very easy for you to scale it out and do all these other things. But there were also some constraints with that, right? You couldn't necessarily take in legacy code, you don't have full configuration capabilities of the VM that it's executing in. And so this ability with virtual network to be able to combine both IaaS and PaaS can allow you to have the best of both worlds. For example, if you want to build a very high scale, scale out sort of web-based experience from a UX standpoint, in other words, you want to build out this great browser-based or mobile app experience for your end users, you might want to do that as a PaaS piece. But the back end to that might be just running on a standard SQL database. You've already done a lot of investment to build that database and design it and tune it to really run very well with SQL Server, you don't want to have to go and re-engineer all that stuff to run with SQL Azure. With this combination of, of running both IaaS and PaaS in the same virtual network topology, you can now have those front-end machines that are, or those front-end uh, services that are their PaaS applications in Azure connected to kind of standard, if you will, Windows Server virtual machines that are also running in Azure that are running your, your kind of mainstream SQL Server instances as well. So this virtual network capability is not just about extending your existing sort of legacy or existing application set into Azure, but also allowing you to do new things that you haven't been able to do before by being able to combine both PaaS and IaaS in the sort of same composite application. So again, just to review before we get into the walkthrough, this is what we're going to be building in the scenario. We're going to be taking the, the existing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the existing uh, Contoso network environment. We're going to have two separate VNets that we build in Azure. We're going to connect those VNets through the virtual network capability, and that's where we're going to be able to manage across both environments, provision, deploy, and be able to access data across both environments. So what do the steps for that really look like? Um, really what we're going to be doing is, is interacting with, with a couple of things in the setup here. One of them is going to be the Windows Azure portal. And you can think of the portal as, as not just the actual UI that you see when you access it through your browser, 
but really the APIs that underlie it. Because uh, the portal itself, um, the, the capabilities that you get from the browser, are really kind of a subset of what's available in Azure from an API standpoint. So in other words, if you go into the Azure portal and you're purely looking in the graphical UI, uh, doing only what's available within the browser, you're only able to do a partial set of the capabilities that are exposed uh, within Azure through PowerShell. Uh, so PowerShell really is, is the kind of the fundamental capability that, that's accessing the API sets directly. Anything that you're going to be able to do in Azure, you're going to be able to do through PowerShell. And some of the things you can do through PowerShell, you can do through the portal. And what we're going to be walking through today, setting up a virtual network, is, is something that you can do entirely within the portal. So there's really there's nothing that we're going to be talking about here uh, that requires you to go to PowerShell to do it. But I do want to highlight the fact that if you, know, if you guys are, are working with something in Azure and you, you, know, you find out, like, well, I'd really like to do this, but I don't see a way to do it in the portal, uh, check out the command reference that we have for Azure. There's a lot of capabilities there that, that are not directly exposed, maybe not obviously how to do that in the portal, or may not be available at all in the portal that you can do with a commandlet. Uh, so one of the things I always encourage people to do is, uh, you know, within, it, within uh, PowerShell 3 now, you've got that capability to really uh, list out the commandlets very easily and, and nicely. Have that up and running as you work within Azure because it makes it very accessible for you to find out the data that you might need uh, to access some of the commandlets to create VMs, create virtual networks, manipulate settings and configurations and so forth. So if I'm the network administrator, the, the, the two pieces I'm going to interact with again is my kind of my on-premises environment, the, the edge of my network today, which in our case is going to be a Cisco ASA device. And then the Azure portal, which again, I could be accessing directly through the browser or maybe through PowerShell. But in any case, I'm going to be operating on those two environments. So I have my network configuration uh, that I already probably know by heart. And the network configuration is, is basically going to be what's my local uh, IP address, my publicly exposed IP address. What are the VLANs that I use internally? What are the network segments that I use? What are the DNS configurations? Kind of all the same things that you would normally think about if you were extending an, an on-premise environment to a colo facility today. So if you guys think about it in your own minds, you, you've almost certainly done some operation already uh, in just kind of your day-to-day -day jobs where you've taken an existing uh, network and you've extended that to some other data center, right? You've built a VPN to extend a site-to-site -site, uh, location to a branch office, or you've done that to a colo facility or whatever. The same sorts of prerequisites that you would do to plan that are going to be the same ones that you would do to Azure. So basically gather up all the data about the way that your network is currently designed today. I'm going to then log into the Azure portal, and on that portal is where I'm going to pass that information. So what, what, is the, uh, what are the settings for the virtual networks that I want to configure? What are the VLAN names? What are the VLAN IP ranges that we want to use? What are the DNS server settings? All that information is going to go into the portal as I configure that virtual network. So now I'm going to have in my virtual network on Azure, I'm going to define this one called Contoso VNet. I'm going to say that the range is 10.1.0.0. I'm going to set it up with an affinity group. So an affinity group in Azure uh, basically is the ability for you to make sure that resources are, are local to a single data center or a single uh, set of compute resources. So if you think about Azure in general, uh, Azure has multiple data centers around the world. We're constantly adding new data centers. You wouldn't want to have, let's say, some of your servers that are located in a data center that we have in South Central US and other servers located in a data center that we have in the West Coast and others maybe in Europe or some other place like that. You know, if you're going to build out a virtual network, you probably want to have some idea of just where the geog geographic location of those resources are so that you can optimize for latency and round trips and so forth. So for most customers, what we recommend is you know, if where, where your major data center presences are today, that if you're going to extend your networks into Azure and you want to have those, those networks in Azure have the lowest latency connection to your main data centers, then obviously locate them someplace that is relatively uh, geographically close to where those locations are. So for example, if you have a major hosting facility on the West Coast, you probably use our, our West Coast Azure data center. Alternatively, if you had a major data center in Europe, you would use one in Europe and so forth. It seems kind of obvious, but, but for some people, it's, it's, for, for some organizations, they're, they're, again, there's sort of that assumption that uh, there's some magic happening behind the covers and you know, we're able to, to do all that smart routing for you. Uh, the reality is that, that really we're, we're not going to be able to, to automatically direct you to the closest data center because we're deploying those resources in one, one single location. So the affinity group, what the affinity group allows you to do within Azure is to say that if I have a set of resources, let's say 10 virtual machines, and those 10 virtual machines, maybe, 10, maybe eight of those are web servers and two of them are, are SQL servers that are comprising a single application that I'm running there. I want to make sure that those web servers and those 
uh, database servers are, are going to be out on, as, on a low latency uh, a network connection as possible. Ideally, I want to have them in the same rack. I want to have them running as, as quickly, as, as closely together as they can. So the affinity group allows you to basically pin those resources together so that you're going to say, even in this, this gigantic pool of compute capacity that we've got in a given Azure data center, that we can make sure that the resources that we deploy into a given affinity group are all going to be in very fast, localized environments so that you don't have to worry about traversing a, a large segment within the data center. Everything is local, so you have the most optimized footprint you can have for those resources. So depending on the size of the virtual network that you're building, depending on the size of the, I guess, the capacity that you're adding out there in Azure, you may want to have one or many affinity groups created. Uh, for example, if you're just deploying a single application, you know, a relative small number of VMs, maybe a single affinity group is all you need. Alternatively, if you're going to have multiple applications spread across multiple data centers or you want to have more control of that, more granularity about it, then having multiple affinity groups may be the better fit for you. So it's really a matter of kind of figuring out what you're trying to do initially. And affinity groups are things that you can add as you, as you need to. So if you, you know, start out with one and later on you uh, need to have two or three or 10 or 20 or however many affinity groups you need, you can always add those as time goes on. It's not sort of a static one-time configuration. So I've got my DNS servers that are on-premise today. I've got DNS 1 over here, which is 0 0.20, and DNS 2, which is 0 0.21. I want to make sure that I still maintain name resolution capabilities within this Azure environment that I'm building out here. So within this environment, within this VNet that I created, this 10.100 network, I've created these three separate VLANs in here. So similar to, again, what you would likely deploy in a lot of your own environments, I'm going to have some kind of like front-end subnet. I'm going to have a subnet for my domain controllers. I'm going to have my back-end subnet. I'm going to have one for my SQL servers. So in this case, in this design, if you guys recall from the previous slide, we had a relatively simplistic sort of thing, sort of a branch office model in the cloud, if you will. So we just have a single affinity group that's containing all that stuff. If we had a very large design, maybe multiple applications, we wanted to tune it differently, we may have different affinity groups. In this case, we're just going to use one. But what we would need to do now is to have a separate subnet that Azure that will create for us automatically as we walk through the setup that's going to be just for the gateway. So this gateway subnet is going to be what allows us to connect the Contoso corporate office into Azure. Now you, on, from a, an Azure kind of management perspective, you never actually see or manage the gateway devices directly as virtual machines. In other words, you don't create a virtual machine, um, install RAS into it, or ins you know, install some other routing tool, and then manage that routing tool directly. Instead, you're going through the Azure management portal, the Azure API set, to tell Azure, create this virtual, create this virtual network for us, connect this VPN in the manner that I specify, but on the back end, what Azure is doing is actually spinning up virtual machines for you, configuring them for, to deliver this RS capability and to connect to whatever resources are in your on-premises environment, but you never see those. So in other words, from your standpoint, when you troubleshoot or you're trying to investigate or, or just understand what's going on from the, uh, from the Azure Virtual Network side, you're not going to log into the portal and see like, you know, VPN Server 1, VPN Server 2, or something like that. You see the, kind of this, this concept of a virtual network, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in the, in the portal in just a moment here. You see the concept of a virtual network, but what you don't see is the actual VMs that make it up or the service elements that make it up. But it's the same building blocks that we use throughout the rest of Azure, that idea of, of having a cloud service, the idea of having those PaaS-based applications. It's the same things that are going into running this gateway. It's not a, there's no hardware device, for example, that's bound to your subscription that's doing this on your behalf. It's just the same kind of Azure VM that we would have elsewhere. So once we configure all this data on the Azure side, one of the things that Azure allows you to do is to export the VPN device configuration script. And that VPN device configuration script is just as the name implies. It's basically the script that you will run on the device to configure it. So you're going to tell Azure what is the sort of device that you're connecting to. Is it a Cisco device? Is it a Juniper? Is it a Windows server? Uh, yesterday we also announced that we're now supporting um, uh, Citrix and one or two others. I don't remember right offhand, but really pretty much all the major VPN device vendors out there, we have direct support for. And the fact that we now added during the spring release the capability to do it with Windows Server RS makes it really simplistic. If, even if you don't have one of those devices or you're not running the right firmware on them or whatever, you literally just have to have a Windows Server and you can use Windows Server RS to provide the, the VPN endpoint. So I get that device configuration script through the Azure portal. I take that now my, as a network admin. I run that on whatever my edge device might be. Again, in our case, this will be a Cisco ASA. And from that point now, I've created my connection. 
So if you think about like from, from really kind of a, a high level perspective of what I'm doing, I'm basically going into Azure and either through the commandlets or through the portal itself, I'm providing configuration information about what the network should be. I provide information about what my local IP address is for, for my site to site VPN that's on prem. Azure creates a config script. I take that config script, I run it on my device, the device is handshake, and I've created the VPN. So very, very similar to what you guys have already done before uh, as you create branch networks or branch office environments or colo environments or whatever. Really very similar sort of concepts here. The main thing that's different here, again, is the fact that when you're doing this within Azure, that this gateway subnet is not a physical device that you go and touch and feel and you know, run iOS commands on and so forth to configure. It's really just Azure um, has capabilities that's running under the covers and is exposed to you as this virtual network object within Azure. So this is basically just highlighting once you've created that VPN connection, now you're able to, to deploy into it. So let's look a little bit at some of the details on, on virtual network. Um, the availability for it became publicly generally available in April uh, as part of the spring release that we had, so you can use this today. There's nothing special that you have to do. It's nothing that you have to add differently to your subscription or sign up for. It's just there and ready for you to use. Um, the SLA for it is to tie to the compute availability SLA that you can see there, 99.9 .9 for the gateway. There's no SLA on connectivity simply because there's so many different attributes or so many different things that can impact connectivity. You know? It's not just simply you know, whether or not our stuff is up, but, but really everything between us and you and all the different providers and routers and everything that might be in between there. So we, we don't provide SLAs on the end-to-end -end connectivity. We do provide SLAs on, on the gateway itself. From a billing standpoint, the, the capability is just it's there. There's nothing that you have to, um, that you have to add to do that. Uh, and the charges for that uh, is basically the standard sort of network charges. Their ingress uh, data is free. Egress you're paying, uh, paying for the, uh, uh, the, the standard rates for that. We also add in the April release um, something that, that's pretty interesting as well for IT pros and, and really for, for, for pretty much anybody that might be uh, operating an Azure subscription, like if you're using one for dev tests, the idea, which is called point-to-site VPN. So point-to-site is basically allowing you to connect securely to your Azure subscription from anywhere without having to go through the overhead of kind of creating a persistent site-to-site -site connection, in other words, a routed connection on both sides. So you can think of point-to-site as basically being client-based VPN, right? If you think Today, all of your laptops, you probably have some you know, Windows um, VPN client or Cisco VPN client or what have you to connect back to your corporate network. You can think of this as being roughly equivalent to that in the sense that your local laptop is, is most likely at least not a router to any place else, but simply a point to site connection from your point of, of laptop to the site that you're accessing in CorpNet. That's really the same sort of idea that we're providing with point to site here. So you can connect from anywhere, uh, you know, from dev environments, the French Quarter, whatever it might be, just a standard VPN. Um, connect from anywhere, but be able to do so by simply just launching a very simplistic and user-based experience. So if you're a developer and you're building applications in Azure, or if you're an IT pro and you want to have a quick and easy way to get access to basically kind of the, the raw IP space within Azure to be able to VPN to, or to be able to RDP to any machine, uh, reconfigure a host, whatever, Point to site is a really nice and easy way to do that. It just works with standard Windows inbox VPN. Uh, there's no additional stuff to install. There's really nothing that you have to uh, have locally on your machine other than just a standard VPN client. So it's not a mutually exclusive thing. It's fully integrated. You can uh, have capabilities of both v of site to site and point to site simultaneously. It's just a kind of an additional way to connect to that same network. So some of the scenarios, again, depth test is really a key one, but I think one of the things that's really uh, particularly interesting is for you as an IT pro to get that, that ability to easily connect into Azure directly and from there to really manage it almost like it's a virtual branch office. All right, so let's do a little bit of a walkthrough through this. Um, what does it actually look like? So the end state that we're going to build, if you think about what the Azure portal looks like, this is the end state that we're going to be building here. So if this is, you know, this is here is a screenshot of your portal. Um, this is your virtual network that's here. This is what we define in Azure. And your Corp HQ, this is what's defined on-premises. So when you go into the Azure management portal after this has been created, this is basically the view that you're going to get. You're going to see the amount of data that's coming in and out, the gateway IP address, be able to download the configuration script, connect the, disconnect the VPN, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, this is the view, view that you're going to see within your management portal. So again, the things that we need to know is, is, is that local information, what's the external IP address, domain controller IP, on-prem subnet, DNS server, et cetera. Uh, we go into to networks, we create a new virtual network. 
And then if you see up here at the top, these are basically the four, the four screens that we're going to walk through. So we're going to provide a name for, in this case we're saying um, Phi MTC is the name. We talked earlier about affinity groups and whether or not we wanted to choose or when to choose an affinity group and then where to deploy into, you know, what data center basically we want to deploy into. So this is kind of just the basic information about where that virtual network exists. That's the first thing that we're going to provide. The next thing we're going to provide is what do we actually want to have for an IP address space within that. In other words, what is the overall IP address space and then what are the specific subnets that are located within that. You can add them as, as just decimals, you can add them as CIDR addresses, whatever is most comfortable for you. But basically, this is where you define the network topology within the wizard. Once that network topology is defined, the next thing that you'll do is to set up what the DNS servers are within Azure. Now, there's a couple of things that we'll talk about in a moment that are unique about DNS and Azure that, uh, that are different than what you encounter in your on-premises environment, particularly about the fact that uh, every virtual machine that's inside of Azure is always getting basically a DHCP assigned address. That doesn't mean that, that they're constantly changing IP addresses. Those, those DHCP assigned addresses are persistent for the lifetime of the VM. Um, but at the same time, you don't ever set static addresses. You need to have the ability to know what these DNS servers are going to be so that you can create uh, within Azure those DNS server addresses to be handed out through DHCP to your clients. Because one of the things that will that, often happen is people kind of assume that, you know, I create this virtual network, I go assign my static IP addresses, I assign my DNS servers, everything works. And it will work at first, but it'll break the first time that Azure does any sort of service or fabric update or does any service healing, and those VMs get regenerated and thus maybe get a new IP address, they're going to get the incorrect DNS information or handed out by, by just standard Azure DNS, and we'll no longer be able to connect to each other. So one thing that's important to keep in mind, and we'll look at this in more detail, is when you manage DNS in Azure, you're not managing it by setting static addresses in the VMs that you create there. You're handing it out through DHCP, and the way that DHCP knows which addresses to hand out are based on this screen that you see here in the setup, setting up the DNS server settings and the local network information. So now what I'll do is I'll create the gateway. Uh, once the great gateway is created, it's going to be available for people to connect to within Azure. Um, so basically, I'll have now uh, essentially the, the Azure side of the environment up and running and, and available to receive traffic. Uh, and what that'll look like is, is what you see here. So you'll see the, the overall name of the virtual network, the subnets that I've defined. It'll say the virtual network has been created. And now at this point, when you see this screen, that means it's ready to connect to. But at this point, all we've done really is prepare the, the Azure side of that network. We haven't actually connected anything to it. The next thing that we'll do is actually connect the ASA device to that. So, uh, again, we'll go in our Azure portal. Uh, on the configure screen, we'll download the actual configuration script. We'll, we're going to know here what the gateway IP address is. This is the, the IP address inside um, of Azure that we're connecting to. We'll create a shared key. You do that directly, again, through the portal, or you do that through the management API if you want to. And then here's the part where you really, you know, download that configuration script. So this is the, just kind of the iOS command script that you're going to utilize to configure that Cisco ASA. So if you were to choose from this vendor drop-down list, Windows Server RAS, uh, you would get a PowerShell script. Or if you were to, to, to drop down and, and choose Juniper, you'd get whatever command line script that, that would work with the Juniper device. That doesn't, unfortunately, mean, though, that you literally just take that device and run it on, on the, within the iOS prompt without doing any modifications to it. In other words, it's not customized to your specific device. It just kind of provides us the initial framework to, that we're going to be modifying to take the attributes that you need. So we'll look at that next. This is the, the kind of the, uh, the, the basically the, the configuration script that you get raw from Azure. So you're going to see the list of, uh, you know, here's a script to run, here are the parameters that we're going to need to update in here. In other words, what is the Azure IP range, what is the subnet mask, what's your on-premises environment. But instead of you having to go and create the entire script from scratch, you're basically just going through and plugging in uh, this information, these variables into the script, and then you're able to execute that on your router uh, or on your firewall device, and then from that point, the entire thing is configured. So we, we're trying to save you some steps, but I don't want you to also think that, that you just simply download the script and execute it, and it's all ready to go. There is, there is some customization that is required. So in our example, um, kind of taking, taking us back to the example that we we're looking at earlier, if you see here the, the lettering in blue or the, the text in blue, these are the, idea, or these are the, uh, the pieces of information that we have changed in our configuration script. So everything in black here is static. This is going to be the same thing for, for essentially everybody that's connecting to Azure. And what you see here in blue is what we've changed. So this is, you know, what do we want to call this within the, within the ASA device? What are the IP address ranges that we want to create there? What's our local IP address ranges? What are the access lists that we want to create and so forth? 
But again, we don't have to write all this stuff out. We're just simply changing variables within the script. So once you download that, you just crack it open in Notepad or whatever text editor you, you prefer using. Uh, and then from that point, you can go and make the modifications that are required to get this all set up. I see you guys taking pictures. That's great. Feel free to do that. You will have access to all these slides after the, the session as well, though. So you can just download all this material. And there's also the, the configuration scripts. You can download them directly from Azure and, and Azure will, you know, from the portal, and Azure will tell you exactly, you know, the, the, the areas that need to be updated. So again, just more information. Note here the pre-shared key. This is something that's created by the portal, so you're just going to copy this information out and add, add it into your script. So once I've done that, and I've run that command on the iOS device, uh, my ASA is going to report that it's connected. Uh, I'll have the VPN set up, and then I'll be able to monitor data in, data out, uh, and basically have a functional VPN. There's really not a lot more to it, frankly, than this to set up the VPN. Uh, it's, it's a pretty straightforward sort of uh, design, uh, and one that, that, in the experience that we've had working with customers over the past several months since it's been out, uh, is, is quite reliable. We really haven't had a lot of issues with, uh, you know, with, with it being inaccessible or with connectivity dropping. Uh, or any other issues like that. It's been a pretty, uh, pretty much kind of a set it or forget it mentality for the most part, although you know, I'm sure there, there may be some problems that, that, that some may encounter. OK, um, so what we're going to do now is to look at Active Directory best practices. So as we kind of build out that idea from that first slide that we, talked, that we showed earlier where we're connecting the Contoso environment on-prem to what's in Azure, the next thing we want to do is to build out Active Directory. So some of the core concepts that, that, that are important to take away here. The first one is, for Active Directory domain controllers, you only want to use Windows Azure virtual machines, the IS capability. You don't want to be utilizing, uh, you know, trying to do this as, as a PaaS application and you know, kind of trying to script an installation of a domain controller. It may seem obvious, but just something to point out since that capability has been around for longer. Uh, we don't want to sysprep domain controllers, and we also don't want to rely on the virtual domain controller cloning capability that's supported in Server 2012 and with Hyper-V. Uh, even though Server 2012 and Hyper-V support that today, that's not something that Azure currently supports. So in other words, the sort of capabilities that, uh, that we enabled in the Server 2012 release around being able to uh, snapshot domain controllers and some of the, the, the advancements around running domain controller in a virtualized environment are not applicable right now to running those, those domain controllers inside of Azure. So you guys probably remember the, the kind of the best practices around not snapshotting or restoring from snapshot. Uh, active Directory domain controllers that you're running in a virtualized environment, those best practices still apply within Azure today. Now that may change in the future, but for right now, you want to treat this essentially as a, almost as a um, you know, 2008 R2 Hyper-V host or something like that from a virtualization standpoint of domain controllers. So placement of the Active Directory uh, uh, of the DIT. Um, one thing that you, know, you can see within the Azure portal is you basically have two separate set, sets of, of disk within Azure. Uh, one that's known as an OS disk and one that's known as a, as a data disk. Uh, and that basically the differential between the two is whether or not there is write caching uh, enabled on there. So for, for OS disk, write caching is enabled. For data disk, it's not enabled. So just like standard Active Directory best practices, you don't want to store the DIT on volumes that are using write behind caching. So be careful about selecting the proper disk to store uh, your Active Directory uh, DIT files on when you build out the virtual machine. So in other words, you don't want to just create a single virtual machine with just the OS disk, kind of the default disk that's created there, and keep everything on the C drive where that data is going to be uh, stored on a write caching disk. One of the biggest questions that we often get is whether or not you should use read-only domain controllers in Azure or whether you should read, uh, read-write uh, domain controllers, kind of standard domain controllers in Azure. Uh, and it's really, you know, people think, like, like I have on there, that's no-brainer, but it's not really, I guess, as straightforward or as obvious an answer. And there's really not a particular best practice or, like, thou shalt only do this or that uh, kind of guidance that I would give to you. Uh, first of all, using read-only domain controllers in Azure is really not what RODCs were designed for in the first place. I mean, RODCs were really designed for uh, scenarios where you had an insecure branch office location. You know, think about the place where... Uh, they've got uh, the server room is basically some closet. You know, they've got a domain controller running in there, but you know they're afraid that somebody could literally go in and you know physically steal that domain controller. Uh, you know, you would want to have a full copy of your directory in that. So that's kind of the idea for RODC. Not really the same sort of problem set within it, within Azure. I mean, you're really not going to be concerned about somebody going into an Azure facility and stealing uh, a physical server, even if they could. Really, there's there's no practical way for somebody to know what physical host, your domain controller would even be on at any given point in time, right? So the sort of kind of core problem that we had um, tried to solve with our ODCs are really not applicable to Azure. 
At the same time, that doesn't mean that it's not a, uh, not a good tool or something that's available for you to use. There's a couple of things that I think that, that ROGC uh, provides to you, which can be interesting um, to, that may be useful to you. One of them is that ROGCs give you that result, the, uh, the filtered attribute set, um, that allows you to have specific attributes that you're going to exclude from the read-only replica. So you may just create uh, a read-only replica with just certain pieces of data on it. That may be desirable if you have a very large Active Directory uh, with lots of objects and lots of metadata associated with it. You want to filter out what you actually store in Azure to optimize your storage. All the storage is really cheap. It's probably not as much of an issue. The only thing, other thing with that is that sometimes you can encounter compatibility issues with that. For example, if you filter out an attribute that you think is not really important or that no one's using, but it turns out there's some you know, line of business application that's using it that you're not aware of, those app compat issues are, are really non-obvious and, and not very predictable. So something to be concerned about or at least to be aware of uh, that's out there. And finally, that, that RODCs, they never uh, replicate anything outbound. So they, they need to populate those cacheable secrets um, in an on-demand fashion for, for authentications that are coming inbound, but it never sends traffic out uh, from, your from, you know, from the RODC to the rest of the organization. And again, because that ingress traffic is free, you're not paying for that ingress traffic from your on-premise environment into Azure, but you do pay for traffic from Azure outbound, right? That's the egress traffic. However, you know, unless you're creating a lot of objects inside of that, you're probably not still looking at a lot of egress traffic from a domain controller that exists in Azure, right? Unless you're actually up there and populating records directly in that, for the most part, you're not going to have traffic emanating from that domain controller that's running in Azure out into the rest of your environment. So kind of the net of this is read-only DCs can absolutely be a good tool for you if you have particular rationale and reasons for using them and you understand some of the trade-offs and some of the potential application compatibility issues. It's great. There's no reason why, you know, there's nothing that's preventing you from being able to do it in Azure. At the same time, don't think of using RODCs as an absolute must-have sort of, I have to do that. It's the best practice. It's really the recommended way that Microsoft says to run, uh, run domain controllers because it's not really the same sort of threat model that, that we saw when, when RODCs were originally in, uh, created. Sort of building on that idea, sort of, and, and maybe the next logical question is, okay, well, if I don't want to do RODCs, you know, should I have a new forest? Should I actually create a completely separate forest within Azure and utilize that for, uh, for any sort of identities, both for devices as well as for uh, users that are interoperating with that within Azure? And it's another case where there's, where there's trade-offs, pros and cons of, of each. Uh, you can have additional security, obviously, because you, when you're creating that separate forest and storing the identities of, of the objects that exist in Azure in that separate forest, because the forest is the security boundary, you don't have the same sort of concerns of, of what happens if a device in Azure is compromised and what sort of kind of outbound uh, risk does that expose to the rest of your organization. That said, there is a lot of additional complexity anytime you create a new forest, right? Uh, when you create that new forest, you've got to worry about, uh, you know, how do you manage that? You've got additional overhead just for managing it, but you also have to put the trust in place. There's a lot of additional pieces that are added by creating that forest that's out there. So again, there's not really a particular best practice for that. But what I would say and what I've kind of recommended to a lot of customers thus far is if what you're deploying in Azure is primarily designed to uh, host identities that are going to be used for external or by external entities, like you're building out an application or you're hosting uh, resources in Azure that you want your business partners to have access to or you want you know, maybe some third-party organization to interoperate with, in those cases, utilizing a separate forest makes a lot of sense, just the same way that it would if you were hosting those, those resources locally and you wanted to have some segmentation of the identity space from those external entities from your, your existing kind of corporate Active Directory. So it's not really the fact that it's running in Azure that makes it a decision point. It's really where are those identities coming from, who's utilizing those identities, and whether or not those identities are kind of part of your larger corporate family or whether or not they're for, from some external organization. To me, that really the decision point comes down to if they are more of an external entity or primarily being used by external entities, oftentimes it makes sense to have a separate forest because it gives you better compartmentalization of that risk. If you're simply extending your domain controller or sending your, your data center into Azure and hosting your own kind of standard line of business apps in there, maybe that makes nearly as much sense to, to create a separate forest for that. So to my point earlier, uh, remember that uh, Azure VMs require that you're always using DHCP leased addresses. The leases never expire. Uh, they never move between virtual machines. So they are sort of a quasi-static configuration, if you will. 
but it's very different than what most people that administer Active Directory are looking for. I'd be willing to bet that you know, for most people that administer Active Directory, if you encountered a domain controller that had DHCP best addressing, you would probably think this thing is misconfigured, right? And typically that would be correct, or at least it would uh, oftentimes be correct. Uh, because of the way that Azure does its IP addressing, it's important that you understand that when you create the domain controller in Azure, you want it to have a DHCP assigned address. You know that the configuration is going to be assigned to it dynamically, but you also know that Azure is not going to be changing that configuration on you. So it's one of those things that's, a, again, it's very an easy mistake to make because people have those patterns really kind of ingrained about managing them statically, but something that's really important that you don't change that. Uh, because if you do change that statically uh, to a static assigned address, again, things will work for a while, but on some very much unpredictable basis, when Azure does service health healing, it may change and then play, then you have a, a configuration that's broken. You don't really know why, you don't know when it happens. There's no way for you as a customer to predict when that service healing will happen. That's why using dynamically assigned addresses is important because Azure will manage that for you. Yes? What about uh, static Mac and all that stuff? Does that kind of still break the model when you're hosting DHCP leases in um, Azure? Well, you're not actually hosting DHCP services in Azure. You're configuring the Azure service that run, runs DHCP for you. You're configuring it with the parameters it's going to pass out. In other words, you're basically pat, you're configuring Azure with a limited set of DHCP scope options that it then provides the resources that, that are out there on, on, on your behalf. Right, but you're okay. not running a DHCP server in Azure, though. So those options aren't even in the... C correct, yeah, you just don't see that. Thank you. Yeah, the question is, has been DC promo updated? It, it is not. You'll still get a warning. So it's one of those things you just, you know that you're going to get, know that you're going to get the warning, accept the warning, move on. Whether or not we update that for R2 or not, I don't know, because there's really, I mean, I guess there, there are certain things that we could look for from um, like a VM bus standpoint to know that we're running on Azure, maybe change that error message. But I don't know that's really the right thing to do other than, you know, for, from a product standpoint. Um, so the, the main thing is, as you'll see on a screenshot that I've got up coming up here, it's just when you get the warning, acknowledge it. You know, you know why you're doing it. It's intentional and, and move through it. So uh, basically the summary of what we've talked about, the, the main thing here is make sure that, that again, that you, that you understand you're using static addressing. Your preferred DNS server is your, is your on-prem DNS IP address, and your alternate is either uh, the loopback address or another DNS server uh, running on the same virtual network. So to kind of give a little brief walkthrough of that again, uh, we're going to create our cloud service. That's where we're going to host our virtual machines. We're going to configure AD sites and services, build our replica VM, and, uh, and get it promoted. So a cloud service you could think of as, as kind of just a way to combine multiple um, virtual machines in Azure into a single unit of network controllability. And what I mean by that is that cloud service is the place where prior to having these uh, this network ACL capability was the way that you would expose specific endpoints and specific services to the outside world. So in our case, we're going to create a cloud service here. We're going to assign um, on that cloud service, we're going to assign it the specific uh, name that we want to use. Now we have a place to land those VMs once they've been created. The next thing we're going to do is to go into AD sites and services, and this is in our on-premise existing environment. We're going to create a, just a standard new AD site. So the same way that you guys have always created AD sites, uh, we're going to provide it the IP address information that you saw from some of the previous slides, uh, which is basically the IP address ranges that we're using in Azure. What we're really trying to do here is to, again, just as you were deploying a new branch office, is to make sure that for those resources that are in Azure, that they're utilizing localized, low-latency authentication sources rather than traversing that VPN link to, to authenticate or authorize resources. So nothing special about this, just a standard AD site setup utilizing the IP address information that you created when you set up that initial Azure VPN, or uh, the initial Azure virtual network in the first place. So next, you're going to build your, your domain controller in Azure. Uh, to your point earlier, if you look over here, you will get that warning telling you, you know, this has got DHCP addressing, it's not recommended, et cetera. We know why we're doing this in this case, because of the way that Azure manages IP addresses. So when you do see that warning with a scary yellow bar, uh, acknowledge that, and, and again, you know why you're doing it. We're doing it intentionally. When you want to deploy a, a domain controller in Azure, uh, of course, you can do it uh, manually, as, as you've basically always done. Uh, so standard sort of way that you would go in there and right-click on you know, a computer and go to properties and so forth. Uh, but really, the more interesting way to do that is with automation. Um, so within Azure, we have a lot of commandlets that are available for us to be able to uh, provision new virtual machines in the environment, including managing their domain membership. So 
rather than you having to build out a VM manually or provision a VM and then manually log in and configure it, you can do that entire process automatically through the, through the gallery. So basically, you call into Azure, so you're going to have to do some initial setup stuff. You're going to install the Azure PowerShell tools, and this is on your, kind of your admin workstation, not the, the individual host you're deploying. You're going to set up your workspace and, and import your Azure configuration. But the main thing you're going to do now is to select the image from the gallery. And this could be a custom image that you upload, or in our case here, we're running the Git Azure VM image commandlet. And this is the standard Microsoft gallery image we have for Server 2012. But you could upload your own image, right? This could be uh, you know, Contoso's Server 2012 image or what have you. You have that image that's in there. And then you combine the name of that image here. So we're going to say we want to use this standard base image and provide these other attributes we want to use to customize it post-deployment. So in other words, by running a single command script, a single PowerShell script that you see here, we're going to pull this base vanilla image out of the library in Azure. And now we're going to join it to a specific cloud service. We're going to join it to the right affinity group, the right virtual network, the right size of the VM that's going to be configured. And then down here is where we're providing all the cool information, basically, about how to set it up in the domain. You know, what is the, what is the, the name of the host? What is the domain username to use? What domain to join it to, et cetera. So the really powerful and important thing to think about with this is once you're able to automate that, you can now wire the whole thing up so that through Service Manager or through some other tool or just manually if you wish to through, a, through PowerShell, you can now take a vanilla image that has no customization directly within the image where you don't even have to maintain the image. Microsoft maintains this image for you on a monthly basis with all the security updates rolled into it. And now you can deploy it in a customized way into your own environment more or less instantaneously. So it's a really nice way, especially if you're building out VMs at scale. You know, if you want to be able to provision 10 or 100 or 1,000 VMs or whatever, you literally just run this script, and you don't have to worry about all the manual configuration that goes into it post-deployment. So once I've got that built out, I see my two domain controllers. Uh, I can join machines to it, again, through, through the uh, commandlet that we just looked at or through a manual setup. Either way, the, 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 at this point in time, I've got my virtual network created. I've got my AD in place. I'm now able to basically deploy resources at will into the Azure. So just a few slides here quickly to go through on, on securing um, those resources that I've got there. The cloud services I mentioned earlier, this, this part changes a little bit with the, the network ACL capability that we have because you have additional granularity. But just from a real high level, think about that cloud service as a way to, to, to abstract away uh, the configuration of what ports and protocols are allowed to an individual host by doing so at the cloud service level. So you can combine one or many hosts into a single cloud service, and then at the cloud service level, you define what are the specific ports and protocols you want to allow into a given machine. So you can think of your cloud service as almost like your almost like a router or a, or a device maybe that you would even have at your home network. You're going to say, I've got this, you know, this single public IP address or this single public host name that's there. I want to publish port 5586 to the RDP port on VM1 on VM and port 5587 to the RDP port on VM2. And Azure, again, you don't manage this VM or this capability that's doing this in the middle. You simply provide a set of configurations, what ports, what protocols, where does it go. And Azure will do all of this load balancing and port conversion for you. So one of the things that we often recommend to people is not that it's a, a security you know, a guarantee, but there's really no reason why you'd want to have your, your RDP ports directly exposed to the internet, right? Just because if nothing else, you're exposing it to a whole lot of, of bots out there that are just going to continuously grind against try to uh, try to brute force attack a cr uh, credentials on it. Even if all you're doing is just changing the port that it runs on, you kind of take away a lot of those bots that are just doing kind of the stupid connect to the default port and, and continue to try with that. Make it a lot harder, kind of raise the bar and, and, and reduce your risk by doing that. So just one simple example of that. But the cloud service, again, you can think of as kind of being that boundary layer there where you say, what is the public port and protocol? And what I want that public port and protocol to convert to on the internal side. And this is what it looks like actually within the uh, management UI here. This is within the portal. Again, of course, it can be managed through command line as well. Firewall settings, this is, again, something that's kind of enhanced with those network ACLs that I mentioned uh, earlier. But obviously, you can continue to set host-based firewalls within uh, Windows Azure. So one of the things we recommend as a best practice is to utilize this to, to provide additional levels of security for the hosts that you deploy or for the VMs that you deploy within Azure as well. And really, the biggest takeaways from a security standpoint is that there's really no magic. Uh, you know, this, we don't change the laws of physics just by deploying something in Azure. 
uh, gravity uh, and the 10 immutable laws of security still apply. So you guys have probably seen and, or heard reference to those 10 immutable laws of security that were published on TechNet. Seems like forever ago, probably 12 years ago or whatever. Those, st those 10 immutable laws about if you're an admin, you can still do whatever you want. If, you're, you know, if you get somebody to run malicious code on your box, it's no longer your box. All those things are still true if you're running on Azure as opposed to running on-premises. Uh, for IaaS virtual machines, you still need to manage updates, which is an important thing to keep in mind. If you deploy a virtual machine out there as one of these Azure uh, VMs, you still are responsible for updating that VM. So you're going to still use System Center or WSUS or even just Microsoft Update. You have to make sure those VMs stay up to date. Now, if there is a, a kind of a, of a code red blaster sort of situation out there uh, in the future, and there's something that's just very virulent and your machines are being used to attack others because they've gotten infected or whatever, we're not going to patch it, but we will turn off the service to that VM until you're able to go in there and manually remediate that yourself. So you have to make sure that if you're going to deploy these IaaS VMs, that you're keeping them up to date, again, the same way you would in a branch office sort of environment. So just to wrap up quickly here, if there's only really three things you take away from this session, the first one to remember is that virtual networks basically invisibly extend your data center in Azure. Once you create that VNet, Resources you put there, users that are accessing stuff, it looks the same as it would if it were locally in your environment. You can safely run domain controllers in, in Azure simply by following those best practices we talked about, specifically around DNS server settings and DHCP addressing, and also being smart about choosing RODCs and new forces as needed to. And then finally, that fundamental security best practices still apply to stuff that you run in Azure. So with that, uh, I'll stay after the session here if anybody has any follow-up questions. Uh, there's a lot of other great sessions on Azure and virtual networking that's out there. Uh, I'd also ask you guys to please take a few minutes and evaluate the session. Uh, we definitely take the feedback seriously. But uh, otherwise, I really appreciate you guys coming. Thanks a lot for your time, and enjoy the rest of your time in New Orleans.